Good morning, y'all, and welcome to day eight of the devotional, hearing and obeying the voice of God in the book of Hebrews. I'm glad you're here. Keep on drawing near, Hebrews 7 and 8. A few winters ago, my oldest grandson, again, this is a devotional, I do not have a grandson, walked into our house on his own two feet for the very first time. There was snow on the ground, an indescribable delight to a 16 month old. And although he is still working on balance, he strolled manfully across the lawn. The expression on his face revealed that he was fully in the moment, completely, completely unaware of the miracle of physics and biology manifested in his teetering steps. My approach to Hebrews 7 this week feels a little like that toddling journey across the, my driveway. With barely a thimble full of scriptural information available as background, the mysterious Melchizedek holds sway over the chapter and demonstrates the amazing ability of the author of Hebrews to connect the dots between Old Testament shadows and New Covenant reality. The truth is exquisite. The implications are breathtaking, and I am fully in the moment, enjoying them, all the while being dimly aware that I am barely scratching the surface of this topic. Here's what we know. Genesis 14, verse 18. Melchizedek was a contemporary of Abraham, thus predating the Levitical priesthood. His name meant King of Righteousness, and he was the King of Salem, an ancient name for Jerusalem, which also gives him the designation King of Peace. Psalm 110, verse 4. David speaks of the coming Messiah as a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This unending priesthood supersedes the traditional Jewish priesthood, which ended in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. These words of God to the Son elevate Melchizedek's role to that of a pointer to or type of Jesus. Hebrews 5. Picking up these strands of truth, the author of Hebrews tightens the weave, presenting a whole cloth of truth in which Jesus emerges as a superior priest, not a flawed human being who acquires a personal sacrifice for his own sin before he is qualified to represent the people before holy God. His is not a veiled heart whose selfish needs prevents him from entering into the needs of those he represents. Here, the author dipping his paintbrush into what he know he knew of Melchizedek reinforces the truth that Jesus, our king and priest, has completely superseded the traditional priesthood, the shadow of the former now being replaced by the solid reality that has been prefigured. Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi, but of Judah, not temporary, but eternal, not a hopeless merry-go-round of many priests, but a better hope through which we draw near to God through a better covenant based on Jesus' indestructible life. In Hebrews 7.25, the author guides us to a magnificent conclusion with the word, therefore. Therefore, he is also able to save to the, save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Mm. As theologically and historically fascinating as all that is, all this is, there are three excruciatingly practical truths embedded in this one verse corresponding to the three clauses. Christ is one. Christ is able to save forever. Filling up the word save with biblical meaning brings me back to the truth that God is infinitely holy and I am not. My own righteousness is insufficient in itself to take me to the presence of God. John Piper describes Jesus as our asbestos-like priest who can take the believer into the center of the fire of God's holiness. There will be no coming to God without this great salvation. Two, he can save forever because he always lives to make intercession. Jesus' ongoing role as intercessor adds depth 
to my understanding of his role as savior. While it is imperative that he died and rose again at an actual historical point in time, it is equally imperative that he continues to serve in the role of advocate, intercessor, and great high priest. He saves those who come to God through him. That's number three. Just as Jesus' role was not a one-dimensional point in time over and done with deal, my role is also ongoing. I am to keep on drawing near every day, looking back at the Arthur, the anchor that secures my hope, and then entering into the minute-by-minute -minute journey of enjoying God. Hebrews 8 ratifies this with the description of Jesus, our high priest, the maker of a better covenant for Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. How would your relationship with God change if you claim those better promises? Do you live in the realization that our relationship with God is not a static, past tense transaction, but a living, ongoing work? How would your day be impacted by embracing this statement? I today will draw near to God through Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to have a relationship, an eternal relationship, a never-ending relationship with you, with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for being the great intercessor, Lord God. Thank you for coming on behalf of us, pleading for us, and making the perfect fulfillment of the ransom for our lives, our souls, Lord God, so that we can have an eternal conversation, an eternal relationship, an eternal connection with you, Lord God. Through your sacrifice, through the shed of your blood, of your flesh, you were able to pay the price for us to always be able to come blameless, to your Father, our Creator. And you gave us the Holy Spirit to always remind us of what it is that your will is, to have a greater understanding of your word and to abide in you and practice your word. Thank you, Lord God, for your promises. Thank you for reminding us that we have the ability to accept them just as we have the ability to reject them. But I ask that you remind us and not just to continue to accept them, Lord God, because you want a relationship with us. And deep down, we know that only you can fulfill any relationship, the greatest relationship that we need, that we desire, excuse me, that we require. And Lord God, just thank you for, again, filling this God-sized puzzle piece that's inside all of us, Lord God. And just encouraging us to remain steadfast in you continue to seek you and find rest and peace in who you are and our identity in you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have a good one, y'all. Peace. See y'all next time.